Hi y'all, I'm Glenn, and this is another in my interminable series of talks about programming languages for the Commodore 64. That, of course, is me working on GeoLink. <laughs> I think most of you know who I am by now. Uh, hardcore Commodore 64 guy. I'm, never, I'm not one of those guys who left it and came back to it after a decade or whatever. I've always had one set up. Hardcore GS user. I'm retired now, but I used to track my stock options using the GS spreadsheet. So, yeah, I'm into it. Uh, blah, 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 all this other stuff. Also, as far as I know, the only person to have written a virus for GS. And I have a bunch of Commodore 64 stuff at lionlabs.org slash Commodore. So if you're interested in some of that stuff and you want to see it, there it is. So this talk is about Geocom, which is a basic compiler for GS. Now, out of the door, that sounds pretty strange. Okay, how could you have a high-level language for such a memory-constrained operating system? Even if you write your code in assembler, you've got about 23K. So how are you going to fit a runtime and everything else? But it was done. There were some high-level languages for GS. For example, there were not one but two fourth interpreters for GS. So all you fourth guys out there, you can play around with that. There was also Becker Basic, which was a basic for GS, but it was a little strange. It was kind of half GS and half not GS, and frankly, I could never really figure it out. But you know, it's one of those weird languages that Abacus published. <clears throat> and then, of course, there was GeoBasic. How many? I should ask first. How many GS users out there? How many people have played with it? You know, a few, a few anyway. Okay. How many have heard of GeoBasic? Okay, so you may know the story that uh, Berkeley was working on it, the people who created GS, and um, they didn't finish it, and this, this was in the waning days of the Commodore 64, and uh, so they were going to, I think they were going to shelve it, and Run Magazine got wind of it, and they said, oh, we'd like to sell this. You know? So they sold it with the caveat that this is not finished software, it's kind of a curiosity so if you want to buy it and so you can really have everything and find play around with it and people that did buy it thought wow this is really cool but they found out very quickly that it was full of horrible bugs and it would eat your code sooner or later it will destroy your code it'll corrupt your code and you'll have to start over from scratch but it showed an awful lot of promise and it was native GS you could, for example, design menus and dialog boxes and preview them and everything. It wasn't quite like Visual Basic, okay, but it, it was a lot easier than coding GS programs in assembler language. Imagine if there had been something like Visual Basic for GS. Is that doable? Think about that for a second. <laughs> I see somebody smiling there. <laughs> you could like scale down the screen, have a scaled down view of the screen and a component palette and drag and drop. It's, it's theoretically possible. GS does drag and drop, right? Anyway, there isn't something like that. There's not likely to be. But what we do have is this basic compiler called Geocom. How many people heard my talk a few years back about uh, Promol, when I was talking about how hard it was to find a copy of it and everything. Yeah, I spent literally decades finding a full, unadulterated version of Promol with all the documentation and everything else. Well, I went through something like that with Geocom only on a much more compressed time scale, a few months, and I had it all taken care of. There was a demo version because this was a paid product. Okay, so there was a demo version that was always floating around, that was easy to find. But I wanted to find the whole thing so I could really evaluate it as language and find out if it was any good. So I did what I usually did. I put a little message on my website. I'm looking for this. Any visitors that know where I can find it, you know, and posted some whiny messages on the mailing list. I'm looking for this. I want some help, you know. And you would be surprised how many people responded. And almost every response was either, here's a link. This is it. Or check out this attached D64, and every single one of them was the demo version, right? I'm like, no, no, I want the whole version. Uh, the other problem, of course, was that the original version was in German. This was a European product. But they later released a version of it in English. So eventually, I found the complete version, but I didn't still have the docs. And 
I got an email from Alan Dickey and he said, uh, you know, Bo Zimmerman acquired my entire collection and I know that there was a copy of Geocom in there with a printed copy of the docs, the complete thing. You know. So I prevailed upon Bo to scan his precious original, which he did, and sent it to me. And I cleaned it up a little and OCR'd it and that's what's on my website now. So, uh, Bo, if you're watching this on YouTube, thank you very much again it's, uh, for giving me the documentation for it. Now, there's only one problem, okay? This was translated from German into English clearly by someone who is not a native English speaker. So the English is, shall we say, not exactly idiomatic. In fact, it looks something like this here. <laughs> well, <laughs> I exaggerate, I exaggerate, of course. I mean, it doesn't look, you know, and I don't mean to make fun of these guys because they really did a bang up job and it's a really good product. But this is actually what the manual looks like. And uh, as you can see, it's very pro professionally produced. And you know, I'll make a lot of raised eyebrows and stuff as I discuss the program uh, syntax and everything. But really, uh, props to Falk Greyvog and Dennis Taylor because they did a tremendous job on this. So what I propose to do is to talk a little bit about the language, syntax, tooling, stuff like that. And then I'll talk about how well it supports GIOS, because that's like kind of the main idea. If it's a nice basic and you can't write GIOS programs with it, it's not much good. Um, and then I've got a little demo that I'd like to show. So first of all, program organization. Your GeoCom basic program has to be written in a couple of sections. The first few are pretty short, but there's a definition section contains program name, permanent name stream, author, some other things. GS users probably recognize that as the contents of the file info block. Okay, so that, that has to be at the beginning. Then there's another section, and none of these are delimited by headers or anything. You just have to have the right commands in the right order, where you have your dec declarations. Okay, so all your variables, labels, bitmaps, and a lot of other stuff has to be declared before they're used. Then comes your code. The last section, the biggest section, obviously, is your, your actual code. Does this remind you of anything? <laughs> Somebody said it already. <laughs> for those that don't know, this is Abacus COBOL for the Commodore 64, which I've been threatening to give a talk about for years. Maybe I'll do it sometime. I don't know. So yeah, you, it, it is something like COBOL. Now, uh, as far as the language itself is concerned, this is a basic with no line numbers. Yes. Uh, back quote delimits a comment, but be careful. If, you, if your comment contains a colon, that'll be taken as end of statement, and the rest of your comment will be taken as your next basic statement, so look out. <coughs> Keywords must be in uppercase. Variables must be in lowercase. Now, there are several things about the syntax that I think kind of care, uh, share a common thread. And my guess here, and I'm just guessing, but I'm assuming that this is to make it easier to write the parser and the lecture and all that kind of stuff. I mean, if you only have to look for capital letters and then check those against the table, it's probably easier. <coughs> That's my guess anyways. Like I said earlier, you must declare all variables and labels. Subroutines, no local variables. So you don't have variables that are local only to the subroutine. You can't pass and return variables. In other words, it's old time basic, right? So if you're gonna use, if you're gonna pass and return variables or use variables only within subroutine, they have to be global variables. That's not too bad, we're used to that. We're retro, yeah. It's got looping constructs. It got, it's got some of the, I guess you'd say more modern looping constructs like repeat until and while loop. It does not have a for next. Isn't that odd, a basic without for next? Yeah. I don't know why. Maybe, it, maybe it's harder to write than the other ones. And you know, in practice, the repeat until stuff isn't that hard to write either, because you just say, you know, i equals 0. Repeat blah, 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 i equals i plus 1 until condition, right? And even the i equals i plus 1 thing, uh, goes faster because there's a keyword inc for increment, right? Which does probably just what it sounds like in machine language once it gets compiled. So the loops run pretty fast. You'll see when I run the demo program that it does really run pretty quickly. 
I'm not really even going to get into this. There is some support for assembly language modules, but they don't even say very much about it in the manual. And presumably, it's one of those things where you have to put a jump table at the beginning of your, of your assembly code and you know that kind of thing. So syntax. OK, so now I'm going to be you know, raising my eyebrows a little bit. Again, this is a tremendous product. It really is a nice little compiler. But you know, things that make you go, hmm, right? So all, repeat, all expressions might be per, must be in parentheses. So this is perfectly good. If you, tr if you write that without the parentheses, you'll get an error at compile time. Arrays, hmm, my eyebrows are going up again. There's no dim statement. Instead, it's row, OK? So row 6 int var i declares an array of six integers named i. And the syntax to reference the element of an array, angle brackets. Not only that, but guess what? It's treated as though it were an expression, so you have to put <laughs> parentheses around it. <laughs> but OK, you know, this is not that hard to get used to. I mean, think about it for a second. Every basic you've ever learned is its own dialect that's different from every other basic, right? So yeah. Strings, OK, strings are null terminated. And uh, you declare them with their maximum length. So that's a little different than the usual basic stuff. That semicolon is unusual uh, compared to the syntax for the other keywords. But you know, there you have it. That declares a string of maximum 63 characters. And there is string concatenation. So for example, if you have three strings a, b, and c, and you want to say c equals a plus b, you can do that. That is, if you go c equals a plus b, right? Now, I could not find anything like print using when I went through the manual, and I, I don't think it's there. Um, but there is something really cool. If, if you think about GS, when you're printing to the screen, you're printing using a proportional font, right? And proportional fonts in GS can be styled. So you can use this escape syntax, print, boldface, select race, back to plain text. And that, I think, is pretty cool. That's my favorite one. So the syntax, a little weird, but nothing that anybody who's written any code ever can't figure out. It's not that bad. As far as the tooling is concerned, <coughs> source code is entered in GeoWrite, which I think is a great thing. GeoWrite is the word processor that ships, ships with GS. I think that's a great thing. You can open a footer and put the page number on the bottom. Great for reading error listings. Uh, you can, oh, you know what I was going to do? <clears throat> the demo program I'm going to show, I printed out some copies of. So <clears throat> why don't we just pass some of those out so you all can look at them. Let's pass them around. And so the other good thing about the source code being written in GeoWrite is there's, there is a utility in GIOS to take GeoWrite and convert the output to PostScript, which you can then schlep over to your PC, change into a PDF, print on your laser printer, and the result is what you're holding in your hands. So yeah, laser printed GS code, very nice. Now, the one thing you can't do, and, and if you have any questions of the syntax later on, you know, just, just holler, because you'll probably see some interesting things in there. Um, the one thing you can't do using GeoWrite, which is nice for assembler coding, is that you can't paste bitmaps right into your code. You need to use a separate editor for that called the object editor. And that's used to create menus, dialog boxes, fonts, which they don't, they don't recommend including in your program because of the memory constraint, arrays of constants, bitmaps, sprites, and some other stuff. But there's unfortunately no way to print out one of those object files. So for example, <clears throat> when you see the demo program, I put a menu up on top of the screen, and then I put the traditional header on top of the screen, screen with the horizontal stripes, you know, and the name in the middle. I had to figure out where the stripes should start. Well, it starts right after the menu. OK, well, what's the right edge of the menu? Gee, I don't know. I had to go in the object editor, look up the menu definition, and write down the number, you know, how many pixels. So, it was, OK, it's 48 pixels wide. So, so that's 
you know, if somebody got interested in Geocom and wanted to write a little tool for it, that would be a great one to write. You know, read an object file, print out a summary of it. Oh, this one is nice. Uh, GS users are used to what's called a desk accessory. The early Mac operating systems had those too, where you can run a little tiny program from within a larger program that's running, and it'll do something interesting like, you know, set an alarm or manipulate text scraps or something like that. Normally, when you're coding an assembler, for example, if you're using GeoWrite, you're writing your assembly code, you're ready to, to assemble it, you exit the word processor, you go back to the desktop, you're loading the shell, then you go and you load the assembler. When you're done with that, you come back and you load the shell again. This desk accessory makes it possible to go straight from your source code to the compiler, so you save a little time there. Um, that's, a, that's a really nice thing. And in fact, it even knows whether or not you saved your source before you invoke it. That one worries me a little bit because it seems to me they have to know the internals of GeoWrite to do that, right? They've got to know where the dirty flag is to be able to do that and check it. It makes me a little nervous, but I've never seen it fail, so. Ah, here's one little downside. The compiler will fail with an error if you try and use it on a micro IEC. Now, I didn't look into what exactly the error is behind the scenes or how easy or how hard it might be to correct that, but anybody who's interested in playing around with this, uh, be, aware of that. be aware of that, that micro IEC will crash the compiler. Too bad. Use your CMD hard drive. Also, there's no debugger. So you have to debug the old-fashioned way, print the values of your variables on the screen. No cross-reference. The compiler does, however, print an error listing of sorts. Okay, here's an example. Okay, so we can see that we have an error in file cnccom. Well, where's the error? He's not printing the offending line of code, right? You notice that right away. Well, that's okay, it's on page four at character 206. Oh, easy, I'll just start counting characters. What? <laughs> wait, wait, it's not that bad. It's at command nine. Okay, so you can count basic keywords and find it, okay, and hope it's not near the bottom of the page. No, it's really not that bad because in practice what happens is as you're learning this, you just kind of get a feel for it and you just end up sort of eyeballing it and going, Oh, it's, an, it's at command 27, that's probably about two-thirds of the way down the page, and you look and you go, oh, yeah, right, I forgot the parentheses, right? <laughs> um, but the error message, syntax unknown. <sighs> okay, can I have a hint? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Integer. <laughs> Integer. <laughs> Well, that's not as bad as it looks either because what that's telling you 99 times out of 100 is that you, you provided an integer, you passed an integer when you should have passed a byte. In Geocom, byte and integer are two separate data types and never the twain shall meet. You can't, for example, add a byte to an int without casting it first. So a lot of times you'll see that the hint will say integer comma byte comma integer or something like that. In other words, that's the signature it was expecting and you look at your code and you go, oh, oops, okay, fine. So not that bad, not really that bad. Here's a picture of the object editor. This is what you use to edit menus and you know, if you want to have a bitmap, you would paste the bitmap from a photo scrap and all this kind of stuff. It's very nice to work with, but again, no preview, no, no summary of where everything is. So this is the magic number I was looking for here to figure out where the, the header goes on the top of the screen. I had to go back in here and look for it. Uh, also, the thing with declaring your labels, another reason for that is if you look here, this is the Oh, in this case, it's GS menu, which is a label, but which is a submenu. But if you have a menu item that calls some code, obviously it needs to know how to find the label for the code, so it has to be declared. Now then, GS support. How good is it at actually writing GS programs? And the answer is superb. It's fantastic. Most GS APIs are supported right out of the box as part of the language. So, for example, in assembly language, if you want to draw 
a rectangle on the screen in GS? How do you do that in assembly language? Let's see. Load byte R2 low top, load byte R2 high bottom, load word R3 left, load word R4 right, JSR rectangle. Okay. There's room for a lot of typing errors in there. Okay. In Geocom, rect top left bottom right. One line of code, just like that. Um, so any kind of graphic environment that there is for GS, what was the other one that was uh, dot basic? Everybody, anybody ever use that? That has some kind of similar syntax, but again, you, you, it's just one keyword with a bunch of numbers following it. So it's really easy to use. For those times when you need to go deeper, there's call and call sys. So you can call directly APIs that aren't, that haven't been provided with keywords. Also, a lot of the GS variables, the system variables are exposed. And with a lot of those, it's baked right into the language. So for example, if you need to pull the mouse position, you just say if mouse y less than 40 or whatever, and mouse y is a keyword. If you know GS assembly, that's something that has to be in your include file. And for the keywords that aren't baked right in, they provide include files. Very nice. Also, for those times when you want to go even deeper than that, you can take the address of a variable or you can declare an arbitrary variable at a given address and then perform operations on it like additions and so forth. So very nice support for the GS APIs and you can go down as low as you want as far as uh, on the bare metal code. It's got good file handling. It also supports VLIR programs, which is like it's like multi-member files on an AS400, for, for people who know that. Um, in fact, you can even write your program as a VLIR file. In other words, it has overlays. And there's like one line of code to swap in a different overlay once you have it set up properly. And the setup is not that hard. So that's a really nice thing to have. That's, again, not something that I played with, but it, it, it uh, really could help you get past the memory constraints of GS. Here's a really neat thing. It supports processes. That's like one of my favorite things about GS. Who knows what a GS process is? Processing, I like to think of as, um, it's like you've heard the term cooperative multitasking, okay? Processes are like cooperative multi-threading. You hand GS the address of a callback routine and you say, I would like you to call this every X number of times through the event loop. And it keeps doing that. So you can do that. You, you define the process in that object editor, and then you just say, process one, that turns it on. And I did that in the demo program. I'll show you that in a little while. It's also got support for graphics printing. Um, like I said before, I don't think there's a print using, but there is an L print, and you can dump bitmaps to your dot matrix printer with this, OK? We all have dot matrix printers, right? <laughs> so that's. That's another thing that it supports. So all in all, you want to write GS programs with this? Really easy, really full-featured thing to do. So now, the big question, how much memory do you have for your program? It's got a 9K runtime, OK? 9K. So that's because all that stuff is built in, right? Uh, but that means your code can be a little smaller. But 6K, ay, 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 ay. Uh, and then there's, there's room for the constants and variables, but these boundaries are adjustable. So if you find that that's not enough, you can, you can tweak them a little bit. And of course, like I said before, you can write uh, multi-module programs, programs with overlays. So this all tends to mitigate the, the memory problem. And you'll see that I did some like moderately interesting stuff in that demo, and, and yet well, I'll show you. Here is a screenshot from the last compile I did of my demo program <clears throat> just before I packed up to come here. And if you look at the stuff in boldface here on the bottom, the code that I used came uncomfortably high to the upper level of 4,000 hex, right? Uncomfortably high. But now look at the constants, okay? I was under half. I used under half of that. So I can get back 2K right there. Look at the, at the uh, variable pool. J 
just over a quarter. So I could probably get back about 3K there, depending on the, I don't know what the granularity is of those, those divisions. So that's one way that you can get a lot of memory back. Makes it not so bad. And of course, you can do all these wonderful things when you're done. You can, you can, you can save the program, run the program. It, it really, they, they really made it as, 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 as much as possible, they, they made it so that you don't have to go back to the desktop and reload the shell. You can go back to the other programs. So it's demo time, and yeah, I'm doing pretty good on time, so I'll be able to have a good demo. Uh, this is the directory page of Geocom as it's distributed. Oh, I have color now. Oh, that's because this is my slide. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, yeah, it's a commenter screen. Uh, but, you know, here's Geocom. Here's that desk accessory that starts Ge uh, Geocom from within another program. Um, this is that object editor that I showed you a screenshot of. Uh, this one, it's not like a linkage editor kind of linker, but it just tacks on your assembly code as a VLIR module. That's what I was talking about before. I, I, I don't want to go too deep into that. But anyway, that's that. And let's have a demo. Let's have some fun. So let me push a button here. <coughs> oh, that was it. There we go. Oh, yeah. See, I lost my color now. I got to sit over here. All right. So this is the source code that I wrote. And these are the three object files that I split up according to what they all contained. And then the output is this compiled program here. So instead of writing like the Great American Program or the Killer GS app or something like that, I decided to just write something fun and write basically the same program I wrote many years ago in my COBOL class, which is a character generator for castles and crusades. If you don't know what that is, it's like Dungeons and Dragons. It's like a subset of Dungeons and Dragons. So we're going to have some fun with this. Here you can see this is what I was talking about. I had to figure out where the menu ended and the stripes would start. And of course, to print this, it does a little math to figure out how much space it has and divide by two, subtract the length of the string. It's got to get the length of that string and everything. So remember that when you see that title change after a while and see how fast it goes. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new character. Oh, I want to show how easy it was to create a dialog box. So I made an info box. OK, fine. Here's a standard dialog box few lines of code for this, easy as can be. And of course, as you can see, my, my beloved cat was quality assurance on this project. All right, so let's generate a character. OK, 3D6, drop the lowest, take those numbers six times, and assign them the way you want. So here we've got a prompt saying, drag the dice rolls to assign. This is where the process comes in. Um, in, in GIOS, there's a vector called other press vector. And what happens is that GIOS takes control, take, takes, uh, takes control of mouse clicks. If you click on a menu, GIOS catches that and runs the service routine. If you click on an icon, he'll catch that and run the service routine. After all of those checks have been made, you can provide a callback routine in an address called other press vector that has your own code for checking other kinds of mouse presses, which is a fairly kind of finagly thing to do in assembly language. In Geocom, it's on one, go to, label. That's all I had to do to control mouse, mouse uh, to, to catch the mouse click. So what I'm going to do is click on here and drag onto here. And what the handler for the mouse click does is it changes the cursor so you know you're dragging. It changes it to a little picture of a foresighter. And then it starts the process. And the process checks every few jiffies to see if the mouse is still down. And if not, if you've let go of it, it checks to see if you've let go, it, let go of it on a valid drop target. And if so, it does the thing for the drop. All of this in a few lines of basic, which is kind of cool. So for example, oh, let's build a fighter here. 
Um, when I click, now watch, it's going to change to a four cider. Isn't that cute? It's a little four cider. Okay. And if I drop somewhere that's not a valid target, it just goes back again. And if I drop here, let's see, we're going to build a fighter. We'll give them a high constitution score. Okay, so now we've dragged that from here to here. All in basic, folks. All in basic. Charisma is not really a dump stat in Castles and Crusades, but we'll do this anyway. And we'll give them a high intelligence. Okay, so now we've got this much done. And you can drag them back, too, you know, if, you're, if you don't want to... You don't want to. You don't want to change your mind. You can drag them back. Okay. Now we're done. So now we need to select a race for our character. And again, if you know Dungeons and Dragons, races that aren't human, you get uh, penalties and bonuses. So, oh, I don't know. Let's make them a dwarf. So notice that Constitution will change to nine, and Dex will change to twelve. I think he's going to lose his bonus on Dex. Okay. So we'll click that. Boom, and it quickly redraws those numbers. Notice how quickly that happened. Okay, so okay, now we've selected a race. At this point, it's going to redraw that banner on top of the screen. So it's going to do all that math we were talking about. It's got to figure out where the left and right are, divide by half, get the, get the uh, it's going to build the string saying race colon table lookup on the number that we chose for you, blah, 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 blah. So we'll do that. Boom. That, that title drew, re redrew really fast. And the same thing will happen when we choose a class. And for those of you who don't play D&D &D or C&C, in C&C not all attributes are created equal, and some of them are called what's primary attributes. So the choice of a class determines one of the prime attributes. Now watch the title change again really fast. And since we're demi-human, we create one additional attribute. And again, this is one of those, you know, oops. Uh -uh -uh. This is one of those uh, on one go to things because I don't, or, or these might be icons. I don't even remember, but somebody who's got the source going to look at it. But this is all very easy. So, so you know, you, you could, and this only scratches the surface of what you can do. I mean, I didn't do any disk handling or file handling or anything like that at all. So, uh, and when we're done, another little dialog box, your character is ready to play. So I got done a lot sooner than I expected to, but uh, does anybody have any questions about the language or the demo? or GS in general. Okay. So if you if you ever if you know GS and and you were ever interested in writing a GS program but you were afraid to because assembly language is too hard, you have no more excuse. <laughs> Get a copy of Geocom from my site and uh, I'll be putting up my slides and making sure I have the documentation and everything else. Yeah. Bill I didn't write the compiler, no. Okay, so can you just, just briefly summarize um, where the software came from and, and uh, where to get it? Okay, this is a picture of the, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> on my screen it is. <laughs> it's still not on color. Yeah, it's still not on color. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> Okay, so it was it was originally a German product. It was made over in Germany by Falk Ravach and, and Dennis Taylor worked on on it with them, especially the example code and the documentation. And it was a it was a, a for sale product over in Germany, and I don't think it was heard much of over here in America. Um, but you know, eventually, as as it happens, these things. They stop selling them, or you know, nobody's buying them, or whatever, and eventually everything becomes available on the internet, as we as we know. Yeah. Yeah, and if you're looking for it, you can find it on my website, um, lionlabs.org/commodore. There's a link at the top of the page that says operating systems and compilers, and then go to that page, and then there's a, a link that says GS. So on GS, there's a, there, there's a link near the top to point to Geocom. And I'll, like I said, I'll put my slides on as well. Yeah? Um, if someone who hasn't used Geocom for a few decades, 
there were, I know there were some <coughs> kind of updates and then there was wheels or something that came along. Uh -huh. Could you write for, I mean, is this Geocon, is it going to be if you wrote something, you think they would use it with some of those uh, later updates or do you kind of think it, that the, uh, Yeah, as far as I know, it should run under any later version of GS, you know, like wheels or, or mega patch or probably any of those. I know there were some of the larger, more complex programs that actually had to be patched to run under wheels, but these are, these are pretty straightforward programs. I mean, it, it doesn't seem to be doing anything special. On the other hand, there's that weird thing with the compiler crashing on micro IEC, so uh, I don't know. But I would, ex I, I would not expect there to be any problems. Uh, again, all those, all those APIs that are exposed via keywords, that's just standard GS programming stuff. There's nothing, nothing weird about it. You know, it's not like you're writing a new device driver or anything like that. So it should work, should work on any version. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs> <laughs>